Welcome to Sunday Sermons from the Williamsburg Community Chapel, brought to you by the Chapel Podcast Network. Discover our Bibles, open up to the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 50. And I'll read verses 33 through 35 for us now, as we prepare to hear from Hunter Rue, as he helps us continue in our summer sermon series titled, The King and the Kingdom. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. What is required to make someone the greatest? Or how do we define greatness? I realize that we are smack dab in the middle of one of the worldwide assessments of greatness right now. It's a small athletic competition happening over in Paris known as the Olympics. And I love the Olympics. I love watching athletes compete at this high level. And it is amazing to observe as some of these athletes continue to gain more and more gold medals, the question is arising about who is the greatest of all time. We can look at gymnasts like Simone Biles and swimmers like Katie Ledecky, and of course, Michael Phelps, who I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it, that he has 23 gold medals in his career. He's now retired, but that certainly sounds amazing and it sounds great. So who is the greatest? Well, we have a little help in answering that question from Muhammad Ali, right? Did he not once declare, I am the greatest? Well, if that's true, Muhammad Ali, you must be. Maybe that's all it requires is declaring that you are the greatest. The problem is we need to understand greatness in a way that is different from the world. We need to understand greatness from the word and from God's kingdom perspective. What is true greatness in God's kingdom? And how do we obtain that greatness? And I'm grateful that in our passage today from Mark chapter 9, Jesus Christ answers that question with great clarity. As we have been working this summer through a series entitled The King and the Kingdom, working through the Gospel of Mark. The message for today is entitled Servant of All. And the value and the focus of this message is on humility. Humility. Just to give us a context for where we are in the Gospel of Mark, Mark is writing the story of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection, and he is about to turn a page and make a significant pivot in the Gospel. Jesus has been conducting his ministry in the northern part of Israel in the country area known as Galilee. And what we will find is that, and and you can see that map, by the way, Uh, I think one of the most important principles in Bible teaching is always include a map. But you can see Galilee is located in the north of ancient Israel. And Jesus is turning to set his sights towards Jerusalem, which is in Judea, in the southern part of Israel. And as he is turning to begin to leave Galilee, in chapter 9, earlier in this chapter, we find a segment known as the Transfiguration, which was an event where Jesus himself was gloriously lit up, brighter than the eye could look at, and a voice from heaven, God the Father, spoke very clearly in Mark 9, 7, saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And for those who are Bible nerds, you may be interested to know that the very central verse of the Gospel of Mark, from the beginning to the end, in the very, very middle, is Mark 9, 7 where God the Father says, this is my beloved son, listen to him, which is instructive for the disciples in the first century and those of us as disciples in the 21st century who do well to listen to the words of our Savior and our King in order that we might walk in his kingdom ways and proclaim his kingdom message to the world. Well, when Jesus leaves that transfiguration mountain with Peter, James, and John, they encounter the rest of the disciples downhill And they have had a frustrating day because they have been unable to cast out an unclean spirit, which comes into play in our text today. Then Jesus is able to cast it out and tells them that prayer is essential in fighting the spiritual battles that we face. 
So now this Jesus who was transfigured, the same Jesus who is beloved by the Father, the same Jesus whose words we are commanded to listen to, shares vital kingdom lessons with us today in our passage from Mark chapter 9. And I think, friends, some of the most vital lessons that we can hear and obey and apply as disciples of Jesus. The idea that I would like for us to take with us today from this passage is, in God's kingdom, greatness requires humility. In God's kingdom, greatness requires humility. So then a natural question to ask is, well, what is humility? I'm glad you asked. A definition that is proposed by Australian pastor and writer John Dixon in his book, Humilitas, reads as follows. Humility is the noble choice to forego your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. The humble person is marked by a willingness to hold power in service of others. And friends, in my estimation, humility is the most important value of God's kingdom, but the least practiced in our lives because it is so hard and goes against our natural inclination towards self. As we look at the passage today, the outline could be seen as follows, that King Jesus modeled humility. Humility leads to a kingdom perspective. Humility leads to kingdom partnership. And finally, humility leads to kingdom purification. So as we begin with this idea that King Jesus modeled humility, let's read verses 30 through 32 here in Mark chapter 9. When they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. This is the second of three passion predictions. In other words, the second of three moments in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus very clearly predicts and tells his disciples, I am going to die. I'm going to suffer and die. And I'm also going to be raised after that. And each of these three predictions, one in chapter 8, ours in chapter 9, and one in chapter 10, is met with great misunderstanding on the part of the disciples. If you remember last week, Luke Kincaid preached from John, or from Luke, Mark, his Luke, he's preaching from Mark, not John. He preached from Mark chapter 8, where Jesus predicts his suffering and death. And what does Peter do? He pulls him aside and says, that's not going to happen to you. To which Jesus replies, what? Get behind me, Satan. So a lot of misunderstanding on the part of the disciples. And Jesus understood that they would struggle to understand this because he knew that they expected the Messiah or the King to be powerfully sovereign, not to painfully suffer on a cross. And what we can find interesting is we are reading through the Gospel of Mark this summer. And another plug for our uh, Gospel of Mark reading plan. I hope you'll pick up this week if you haven't been, and if you've been joining us, I hope you'll continue. But we've been asking and answering the question of where do we see people's misunderstanding and resistance to Jesus' kingdom? What is interesting is that some of the greatest misunderstanding comes from the people who are closest to Jesus, his disciples who are with him day in and day out. They heard what he was saying, but they weren't really listening to it because The paradigm of the king in their mind was far from what Jesus was actually teaching them. Ironically, this misunderstanding happens three different times in chapters 8, 9, and now 10. What Jesus was doing is that he was foreshadowing the greatest act of humility, which would be the ultimate act of kingdom greatness, his suffering and his death, but the disciples just did not understand. Their failure to comprehend is going to be further exposed in the section that follows, as we see how humility leads to a kingdom perspective, picking up in verse 33. And when they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing along the way? But they kept silent, For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest 
And he sat down and called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the middle of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So, They're in the city or the town of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, which is a place that they have been many times, maybe in the house of the disciple Peter himself. And as they sit down, Jesus decides to provide a discipleship pop quiz in the moment as he asks, what were you discussing along the way? (laughs) Now, we should know, as we have been learning, that when the almighty, all-knowing God of the universe, in this case, Jesus in the Gospels, asks a question, he's not looking for information. He's looking rather to give instruction because Jesus knew exactly what they were talking about. Jesus knew how they were talking about it. The text tells us they were arguing and he knows why they were talking about what they were talking about. They were asking who is the greatest because they in their own arrogance and self-absorption had a misunderstanding of what made someone truly great in the kingdom of God, and they needed to be redirected. In other words, they were taking the Muhammad Ali approach to discipleship, right? I am the greatest. And they were having this argument. And I wonder what the criteria and the argument went like. Maybe it went something like this. Matthew was claiming, I healed four people today. To which John would respond, I cast out six demons this week. To which Peter, as he was apt to do, would butt into the conversation and say, just remember, he called me first. Didn't you guys read chapter one? And finally, Judas, with smugness, would say, just remember, guys, Jesus put me in charge of the finances of this operation. That must show that he really trusts me and I am the greatest. You see, the problem with pride is it always prevents us from embracing a perspective that is centered on Jesus and his kingdom and instead puts the focus on us, our gifts, our knowledge, our experience, and our understanding of greatness. And and here's what's ironic. Did you recognize that just before this, Jesus was telling his disciples, I'm going to suffer and die? And yet, what do they do in the next moments? They are arguing about who is the greatest and who had the most impressive ministry resume. Just as in today's time, status and honor were important values in the ancient world, and the disciples could not refrain from arguing about who was the number one disciple. That is because they lacked humility and they lacked a kingdom perspective. Now, what's interesting in the text is Jesus asks the question, but Mark tells us nothing about anyone saying anything in response. It's almost as if he says, so what were you guys talking about as we walked? You can imagine the disciples kind of looking down, looking at each other, maybe shuffling the dirt at their feet, one saying to the other, I I, I don't want to tell him, do you? (laughs) Jesus knew exactly what they were talking about, and yet in grace provides an opportunity to give a kingdom lesson to his disciples And to us. And in doing so, Jesus challenges the conventional understanding of status and importance and greatness. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. He adds that for emphasis, not just last, but last of all, not just a servant, but servant of all. And this would not have made any sense to the disciples. It does not make a lot of sense to us because this is an upside down way that God and his kingdom and Jesus as the king operates. We naturally believe, as the disciples did, that true greatness is found through successful accomplishment, public recognition, a job title, class rank, or maybe even a place on the podium of the Paris Olympic Games. And as significant as these realities might be, they don't achieve greatness in God's kingdom economy. Greatness requires humility to be a servant. That is why Jesus says in the previous chapter, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And he says in the chapter to follow 
Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Friends, we also see Jesus modeled this perfect humility when he uh, was able to put on a towel and wash his disciples' feet, which was an act of a servant. Jesus tells and shows his disciples that humility defines true greatness in God's economy. And to illustrate it for them in the flesh, he takes a child and brings a child in the middle of them. Now, in our modern world, we love our kids. I love my kids. I've got some, I got a son sitting back there. Um, in our modern culture, our world revolves around our kids, not in the ancient world. In the ancient world, children had no status as citizens, no rights. They were social non-entities, people without status. And what Jesus says is, you see this person without a status, the greatest of you will serve one like him. And in doing so, become like this child to become a servant who also did not have a status. Jesus wanted his disciples to resist the temptations to be pretentious and absorbed in self-advancement. Doing so would be essential for them to participate in the mission that Jesus was calling them to join. And it would require them and it requires us to set aside selfish ambitions. It's amazing to think how upside down that is. Greatness requires humility. Greatness requires humility, which leads to a kingdom perspective. And it also leads to kingdom partnership. As we look at these next few verses, remember this message of Jesus, that he is going to suffer and he's going to die, and that greatness requires humility, and see how the disciples still struggled, especially John in this context, to understand the lesson that was being taught. Verse 38, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, literally the text reads in the original language, uh, because you are of the Christ and the name of Christ will by no means lose his reward. Apparently what has happened is an unnamed and unknown to the disciples exorcist has been casting out demons. Now this person was not part of their inner circle. He was not trained and discipled in the way of Jesus directly from what we can tell. And so the regular disciples tell him to cease and desist, even though apparently this person was casting out demons successfully under the authority of Jesus and in the name of Jesus. And maybe, just maybe, John and the other disciples were a little bit sensitive and a little fearful and feeling threatened because earlier in the chapter, I mentioned early on, they had been unable to cast out an unclean spirit from an individual. So maybe the concern and the chatter at the water cooler was, oh my goodness, there's someone else who's casting out demons. Maybe Jesus is going to hire outside of the organization and kick us out and bring this person in. They could have been fearful that their status as disciples was in jeopardy. What they did is in doing so and in their failure to be humble, they were not including but excluding. They saw themselves as the only ones worthy of doing ministry in the name of Jesus. Rather, Jesus pushed them poor, towards a posture of inclusion rather than exclusion towards unity rather than disunity. And this is a posture that is only possible when we're humble. Only then are we able to invite others in and join with others in kingdom partnership. Now, watch how pride slips insidiously into this account. It's a small word, but one that I hadn't really noticed as, until I was studying this past week. In verse 38, where John says, we tried to stop him because he was not following us. I thought the point was to follow Jesus. Now, if he had said, because he was not following you, master, 
then maybe we would have had a little more understanding that the disciples were in a better spot spiritually. But the fact that he says he was not following us shows such presumption and self-importance and a lack of humility on the part of the disciples that, friends, we can be guilty of as well. It appears that John and the disciples had a proud and inflated view of their own importance. The point was not to follow them. The point was to follow Jesus and to recognize him as the true source of kingdom power. But their lack of humility led them to miss the point as they saw their place in the inner circle as a place of privilege and entitlement rather than one that was to lead them to be humble. And Jesus, in grace, again, begins correcting their misunderstanding, just as he does our misunderstanding when he says, the one who is not against us is for us. That is why we see humility leading to kingdom partnership, because it opens the door to other kingdom values like humility or like unity. And I do believe a lot of the division that we see in our day and age will really grieve our Father in heaven as he looks down and see how we are so divided rather than united as the body of Christ. Humility leads to a kingdom perspective, and it also leads to kingdom partnership. Finally, humility leads to kingdom purification. And by kingdom purification, I mean a willingness to surrender to and suffer for our King, Jesus. As I read these final words from our passage, notice the words that are repeated, phrases and words like causes to sin and to throw and fire and salt. Jesus continues, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Wow. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better that you enter life cripple than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Whoa. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if... Um, your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. <laughs> it is better that you enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Forever will be salted with fire. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Friends, these are some of the more radical and shocking words that Jesus speaks in all the Gospels. I don't want us to miss the point, though. The point here is that Jesus wants us to have a wholehearted allegiance to him and his kingdom commands and his kingdom ways and to take great lengths to avoid anything in life that would draw us away from that. Jesus stresses that living a life that is consistent with his kingdom is imperative, and we should avoid all causes of sin at all costs. Otherwise, we will veer off course from following our king. Jesus brings another child, in a sense, right before them and says, if anyone causes one of these little ones to sin, one of these little ones, yes, is a child, but it also refers to a disciple who is vulnerable and weak. And Jesus uses this phrase several times, cause to sin, cause to sin. The word in the Greek language is skandalizo, where we get our English word scandal. So in other words, causing someone to sin and preventing them from following in the path of obedient discipleship to Jesus is literally scandalous in the eyes of God. His first illustration involves a millstone, literally the millstone of a donkey. It was a large stone that was placed on top of another stone, and oftentimes a donkey would be used to make this stone move for grain to be crushed so it would be usable. These could have weighed anywhere from 100 to well over 1,000 pounds. And Jesus said, if you cause a little one to sin, it's better that this is put around your head or tied around your neck and you're tossed into the Sea of Galilee. This, friend, sounds almost like something out of the Godfather, right? Like Vito Corleone saying, give him the millstone. It's my best Marlon Brando. That's all you're going to get. 
The mafia might use that tactic to teach their opponents a point. But Jesus was using this illustration to teach an even more important point. A lesson about God's wrathful response to those who put a stumbling block in the way of another disciple, leading them to struggle in their faith and waver in their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus continues and amps up the shock value of the language, this time turning to more gruesome illustrations where he writes and, and, and talks about if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot, cut it off. If your eye, cut it out. Now, we, under, we are smart enough to know not to take this verse and these verses literally from the standpoint of please don't cut any body parts off or pluck them out. Our problem isn't that we know not to take them literally. Our problem is that we don't take them seriously enough. We don't take seriously enough Jesus' call to make sure that we pursue kingdom purification through humility, through obedience, through surrender, and remove every source of temptation that might find its way into our lives. It's a radical call to discipleship, and it is a struggle for us. It's a struggle for me. But our failure to take drastic steps in the battle against sin and temptation leads us on a path of destruction that is likened to the eternal torments of hell. Now, the word hell here in our English Standard Version of the Bible is a Greek word, Gehenna, which comes from a Hebrew word, which means the Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. This is, as you can see on this map above, this is a south or southwest valley in the ancient city of Jerusalem, where in the Old Testament times, even the kings of Israel or Judah sacrificed their children to the Canaanite god Molech in this detestable place. And this was so detestable to God that uh, the valley of the son of Hinnom, or the valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna, became associated with a place of God's justice, God's judgment, God's punishment. Jesus says, rather than endure punishment, we should allow kingdom humility to lead us to purity in this life doing all that we can to cut out those different sources of sin and temptation that can draw us off course from following Jesus. And friends, we need the grace of Jesus and have to often confess in humility that we need his strength and his courage to do that. The cost of discipleship is high and it requires humility. Examples of what this might look like in our day, because we're obviously not removing body parts, please hear me but maybe other aspects of our life need to be removed. For example, if that app causes you to sin, delete it. If that social media account causes you to sin, close it. If that bottle causes you to sin, pour it out. If that worldly possession or that investment account causes you to sin by finding false security and salvation in it, sell it. If that location causes you to sin, flee from it. And if your pride causes you to sin, surrender it in humility to our good and gracious King. Friends, these and other sources of temptation are like a spiritual cancer that will cause us to dishonor our Savior, to stumble in our discipleship, and ultimately be ineffective followers of Jesus on his kingdom mission. My hope for my life my prayer for all of us is that we would take sin seriously enough because Jesus himself took sin seriously enough that he was willing, even though he was completely sinless, he was willing to allow more than just his hand or his foot or his eye to be removed. He was willing to be cut off completely and give his whole body and his life for us on the cross in order that we might be forgiven the ultimate act and the greatest act of humility in God's kingdom economy. We've seen uh, today from Mark chapter 9 that in God's kingdom, greatness requires humility. And when we grow in humility by his grace, we have a clearer kingdom perspective. We have richer kingdom partnership with others. 
And we have fuller kingdom purification where we are obeying our king. To help be encouraged in this importance of humility in the weeks to come, I want to make a resource available to you that I hope, alongside with your Mark reading plan, you will be uh, delighted to read. It's actually a series of devotional quotations from a book entitled Humility by a South African pastor named Andrew Murray. My friend Brian Owens right there was the one who gave this uh, book to me to borrow, and I found it to be so encouraging and challenging and convicting that I was able to type out several summaries of it, and I would love to share this with you so that you can take that and continue to meditate on the importance of humility as we follow Jesus. You can either email me, and I will be glad to email it back, or you can visit wcchapel.org worship, and you will find that document there linked on that website. The world will tell us that greatness is found in impressive accomplishments, but we must remember that we do not evaluate greatness by the same standards and in the same way as the world. In other words, let's avoid the Muhammad Ali approach to discipleship by declaring that we are the greatest and recognize instead that we are the greatest and we are humble and willing to be last of all and servant of all, following in the steps of Jesus Christ, looking to him as our king who modeled perfect humility when he gave his life for us on the cross, whereby he was able to be the last of all and the servant of all. Thank you for joining us today. Here at the Williamsburg Community Chapel, we are all about making disciples of Jesus Christ. So wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we hope you will join us this summer as the Gospel of Mark teaches us that Jesus is the King and how His life initiates a new kingdom.